Hey everyone, it's me. Thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate it. We're actually going to do a reaction video today. I know I cringe at reaction videos, but I thought, you know what? If you can't beat them, join them. So we're going to have some fun today with a reaction video and specifically talking about uh, Canadian Armed Forces equipment. Now, I get so many questions asked to me about how good or bad Canadian Armed Forces equipment is. Um, as I'm serving as a reservist in the artillery, I don't get to see all of the more uh, up-to-date or high-tech bits of kit that have been given to regular force soldiers. However, I still see enough of it and get to hear or hear enough uh, exposure and experience to it through people who do use the new stuff. And what I'd like to do a reaction video on today is a force protection soldier on Operation Presence Mali. This is a Canadian Armed Forces video. Um, I actually find it really nice. I think we need to see more of this. I think we need to see just short, sharp, concise videos that give you an idea, a very small tidbit of what the CAF is up to and what it's doing. Um, because, you know, we see a lot of training videos, but I don't feel like we see enough of these kind of videos, actual operational deployments um, and just short tidbits because the culture that we're in today, everything is short, sharp and fast, right? We've got like, you scroll through Instagram or cringe to say TikTok. God, I hate TikTok. Um, but I'm not saying this stuff should be put on TikTok, but it's nice to see just a short insight into some of the equipment that the Canadian Armed Forces uses. Now, this is an interesting video because um, force protection is a unique role when you're uh, deployed, and it's basically exactly what it means. You are protecting a specific force or an asset, whether it be like a uh, convoy or, uh, you know, in this particular instance, helicopters as Chinooks, uh, CH-47. So, you know, there's, there's a specific niche, I guess, for the equipment that each uh, branch uses. But in this case, it's very much specifically designed around force protection of helicopters, which is really cool because... Um, you don't see a lot of information um, from the Canadian Forces about these kind of niche roles. You see like standard infantry loadouts, you see standard artillery loads out, loadouts. Um, it'd be nice to see other branches and other trades showing what they do. Even, you know, engineers like, you know, breach laying kit. There was some really good social media recently of um, pioneers breaching through fences with, with you know, uh, wire cutters and, and angle grinders and all that sort of stuff. That's really cool. I'd love to see more about the breaching side of things uh, and how operators um, in the engineering world work and maybe even more on the SF front, right? Special Forces. It'd be really cool to see the same format that we're looking at right now, which we're going to go into right away. I will not delay any longer, but it, it will be cool to see more of these kind of videos, just giving a rough breakdown of, of what we have. So in this instance, as I said, the soldier is quite specific on operational deployment in Mali. Uh, and some of the kit that he has is is, is pretty cool. Um, and I'm not going to say that it's it's top tier, you know, high tech, incredible kit. And a lot of the people that are watching this may be either ex-serving or serving Canadian Forces members probably screaming at the screen right now saying, Matt, it's all junk, blah, blah, blah. But let's just take a look at it. I want to go through this a little bit. Hey everybody, I'm Private Gregory Kuzik. I'm part of Canadian Forces Royal 22nd Regiment, 3rd Battalion, based out of Valcartier. We're here in Gao Mali in it's about toasty 48 degrees Celsius. Uh, what I do here is I'm part of a team that takes care of force protection for the Chinooks that go out on medical evacs. Now, before we get going, before we get going here, a lot of people have in the past made fun of me putting on weight. And I, look, I get it, right? It's completely fine. I have put on weight. I'm actually doing really good now. I'm actually starting to lose some weight, which is nice. I'm on a bit of a keto diet right now, so it's going really well. Um, but regardless, it does not affect my physical ability i find to soldier i am fit as a fiddle i nail the force test uh i've never really got anything lower than a silver which i know isn't exactly a high level of fitness standards but considering silver is a i would say sort of the basic standard i've never had a problem with that uh and although i've got a little bit of chunk around my sides um i can keep up with some of the fittest guys in in certain regiments certain battalions uh, certainly not where i used to be but in this instance, we're talking about a deployed soldier, right? A deployed soldier in an infantry role uh, that is working as force protection. Pretty serious stuff, right? You need to be pretty fit. And I can guarantee you this dude is fit as a fiddle. I guarantee he's got high levels of fitness. But if you notice, he does have a little bit of a pouch coming on here. A little bit of a, a bit of a uh, you know sausage roll. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? The, dude, the dude's probably beefed up, got a lot of muscle under there too. He's a bit of a beefcake. You can see his shoulders, he's a big guy. I uh, could probably outbench and outpress anything I can do, but he still has a bit of a bit of a role. Now that could just be muscle the way his shirt's lying. If you look a bit carefully though, you'll notice in a couple of instances, right, there is a little bit of bit of chub there. But that's okay. That does not defeat his ability to soldier. I guarantee his fitness is at a good level, right? For what he's doing. 
He's not an operator. He's not jumping through buildings, punching through doors and breaching buildings, all that sort of stuff, right? He's force protection, but he can probably handle himself very well in fitness. So I know it's totally off track from the equipment, but just a note that I had in this situation, most people say, oh, look, he's got a, you know, he's got a little bit of podge on him there. No, 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 no. I guarantee this dude is fit and he has got a lot of fitness behind him. Uh, do not be deceived by the way people look. Okay, I've seen skinny guys who ripped six pack, can barely do a rock march for, you know, 10 kilometers. I've seen bigger guys, bigger than me, got more weight than me, that can run, out rock, and out sprint some people who, who are like very skinny, very lean, and very, you know, I guess robust, right? It's, it's interesting. So don't judge, judge a book by its cover. And I'm not trying to deny the fact that being fat is a good thing or being overweight is a good thing. That's certainly not what I'm trying to say. What I'm saying is don't judge a book by its cover. I did when I watched this video and then I thought to myself, Matt, you're fat. You're overweight. This dude is not fat. And I would hardly even say he's overweight. He just has a little bit of roll there, but just something I noticed. So reaction to equipment. So he is currently wearing what was called in the Canadian Armed Forces, we call it OTW. In the British Army, you call it UBACs or underbody armor, assault carrying system or shirt system, something like that. Uh, but we call it OTW, outside the wire uh, jacket, which is basically a tunic mixed with a t-shirt, which is a little bit thicker material than a t-shirt and a zip up at the front. The best bit of kit you can get in the army in, 20, in the 2020s, right? I mean, they've issued this stuff a long time ago, but wearing this stuff nowadays, it should be standard. We do not tend to wear OTWs often. It's normally under privilege because they're not, they are issued but they're not regularly issued. You're normally either going to wear your tunic or your combat jacket when you're doing standard uh, you know, exercises and training. Obviously, on an operational deployment, you do get the OTWs. They are an amazing bit of kit. You'll notice in this OTW, he does have the uh, the pouch there with something to put in, some Velcro, uh, a more robust zip. Some of these OTWs you can get from like weak suppliers. Some of the suppliers are really rough, fail really badly. Now, I am um, working with Battle Tactical Supplies, who are an amazing supplier, by the way, of OTW. The best OTW supply you're going to get in Canada, if you're watching this, is Battle Rattle Tactical Supplies. They are the best OTWs you can find. Great bit of kit. But this is a game changer, especially in operational deployment, because you're wearing a tunic. That tunic material just soaks up that sweat, and it's near impossible to get rid of. With this stuff, uh, you know, with the shirt and the tunic mix, your body armor sits nicely on it. It wicks uh, sweat better. It's just more comfortable. You can get, um, you know, the uh, the uh, arid uh, version of this, of course, the green and uh, the green cad pad, the relish, as we call it. Uh, but he's obviously wearing the uh, the um, temperate version. But if you've got OTWs and you can wear them, you're allowed to wear them. Trust me, especially going like things like PLQ and more 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 of the intensive training courses, things like that, or even going on long distance exercises. Uh, this is what you want to be wearing, okay? On medical evacs. Uh, what we have here is my usual kit that I wear on daily basis whenever I go out on runs. To start off, 9mm Browning HP pistol on my hip. Okay, so he's got a Browning high, Browning high power. Look, I have to be very careful with this video. Of course, I can't put opinion opinions to things too much. But what I can say is I dis... Prior to coming into Canadian Forces, I despised the Browning High Power. I used it in the British Army, and I'm allowed to talk about that. Um, I despised its use in the British Army. We were issued a 6-hour P226 in Afghanistan. Uh, a lot better than Browning High Power, I can tell you that much. But still an absolute piece of junk. Now, again, many of you are probably screaming at the screen right now saying, Matt, the 6-hour P226 is an amazing handgun, blah, blah, blah. No, I'm sorry. In Afghanistan, it was absolute garbage. It jammed constantly. You could either over-oil it, under-oil it, grease it, spit on it, cover it in water, whatever you want to do, try and make it lubricate correctly. There was never an appropriate level of commu uh, communication, lubrication, you could put on the P226. The Browning High Power, however, would keep going regardless of what you would put through it. The 1911 platform is pretty solid and the Browning High Power is pretty solid too. The problem with the Browning High Power is you have to put the magazine in to release the trigger. You can see where that's a problem. I myself, and I'm not going to deny it, I'm dead honest because I think it's good people learn from mistakes. I have made an ND, I've made a negligent discharge on a Browning High Power. Luckily it was at the range, my weapon was pointing down range. I thought I had an empty magazine, I, it was a, a night shoot. I accidentally put um, the magazine in 
not believing that it still had rounds inside there. I had got the wrong magazine out the pouch. It was a stupid mistake. I learned from it. But Browning high powers are dangerous. Uh, they are a old school form of safety feature to have the magazine inside of there. It's it's just not the way things should be done nowadays. Uh, in terms of its reliability, yes, I would say the Browning high power is a reliable handgun, but it's yeah, it's it's not the greatest. I'll tell you that. But it does what it needs to do. That's the end of the game. And you notice here he does have a, a, a sort of rigging belt here. I hate the loop rigging belts. I cannot stand the cinch rigging belts. They drive me nuts. I have to have a clip. I have to have a clip because cinch rigging belts, if you're in a pinch, get it, cinch, pinch. Sorry, terrible dad joke. If you're in a, in a pinch and there's something going wrong, I'd say, you know, um, you need access to a casualty. I've seen it firsthand where people have these belts on and you can't get into them to undo them. Now, I'm not saying we want to take people's pants off, but in a medical situation, these things are horrible. They're great for if you want to use as an emergency tourniquet because it's nearly impossible to get them off. And they're really good at tightening up. But I like belts with a clip because, yeah, quick release. You can pop them off quickly if you need to. Um, specifically when you're doing a lot of, like, section attacks and things like that, you want a belt that you can readjust your equipment. Um, you know, you, you, your OTW is going to come out untucked. Oh, it always does. Um, so I'm not a big fan of these kind of belts, these rigging belts. I, I prefer something that's clip and tuck. Uh, you know, you clip together and you tuck off the end piece or with either Velcro or a band. This isn't my favorite. And obviously he has two spare mag pouches there. Um, good for him. You know, like it's having a couple extra mags is really important. Um, I know some people in Afghanistan and the Marine Corps, they carried up to like three or four um, down the side of their left leg uh, on their on their uh, on their thigh. So this is a little bit different on the on, on his waist there. I must admit this wouldn't preferably be where I'd want to have my I, my magazine pouches or my handgun for that matter. I actually had mine attached to my thigh uh, with a thigh holster. He has it on a hip uh, holster, which is, you know, everyone has their preferences, but certainly not what I would choose anyway. As well as additional mags. Next up, I have my fragmentation vest that I wear. Contains my bulletproof plates. Okay, so fragmentation vest. Um, look, it's not it's not perfect, but it's not that bad. I have worn Osprey. I've worn CBA from the British Army. CBA was awful in the British Army. I must admit, the body armor that the calf has compared to the old CBA that we would have in the British Army, second to none. I mean, it's so much better. Um, Osprey was on a different level. Osprey was very similar to the British Army's, um, oh, sorry, the Canadian Army's uh, Kevlar vest or uh, frag vest, as we call it, but. The frag vest does have a couple of extra features that the Osprey didn't have. It does have a nice collar um, to protect you from the strapping, especially if you're rucking, things like that. It also has the um, sort of rubber meshing that you can see on its shoulders there. Really nice to keep a stable platform on the C7 or the C8 or whatever rifle or weapon system you're using. Uh, more specifically, actually, on the uh, on the C9, because obviously it's a uh, so like a, a fully automatic belt-fed weapon that thing likes to move. So those little rubber tangs there like hold it in place a little bit better. You can have an attachment that's put onto uh, onto the uh, frag vest as well. They're kind of like shoulder cuffs. Most people take them off because they they're seriously not comfortable. They get in the way. They fall off. They unclip. Uh, so you'll notice, as you can see in this situation, they're not there. Um, it is quite easy to get on and off. The only problem with these is if you're a bigger guy, like a taller guy like me, you have to expose more of that Velcro that you can see he's strapped onto his front. So that Velcro likes to rub right here, right on the edge of your clavicles, and it gets really old really fast. You have to kind of like pull your t-shirt up to protect you, but if you want that air cooling, you know, it, it gets a little frustrating but overall i've never had any major issues with uh you know the frag vest that we have in the calf the plates are pretty big they cover all the major extremities obviously lungs heart same for your back um there's no side paneling um, or side protection for the most part in this uh, combat body armor there is kevlar protecting you all the way around your waist but no plate um, and to be honest i don't really think it's necessary i have seen injuries in afghanistan where bullets are going through the side of kevlar uh, vests but to put plates on your side it's it's really tough there is armor systems out there today that have that but in this situation um i don't think it's really necessary next up i have my tactical vest which i have a whole bunch of goodies on camel back okay here we go the 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 piece de resistance right 
Tack vests. Um, in this situation, you can see he has an unissued tack vest. Um, this is not something that is standard issue for the Canadian Armed Forces. However, depending on the situation you're in, the environment you're in, the kind of work you're doing, um, the CAF's pretty good about it, actually. There's a lot of transitioning going now where personalized equipment is more freely accessible and approved. Um, there are some stringent rules on that. You have to be careful when you're ordering specific personalized kit because it comes down to insurance and liability, right? If this soldier was hurt, um, you know, in this situation, in a combat em environment, and he was wearing that piece of equipment, if something failed on there or had caused him injury or had, um, you know, uh, personified the damage that was happening around him, whether it be shrapnel from the, the, the straps or whatever, if that hurt him more, it could cause issues in terms of liability for, you know, his medical coverage, things like that, because it's not authorized, tested, issued equipment. However, it is getting better. And as you can see in this situation, he's using equipment that isn't fully issued, uh, but still works for him, right? And that's where this comes down to is if the equipment works for you and it's approved, it makes sense. And it, it's not crazy, right? We're not talking about like, you know, black multicam, you know, cryptic colored stuff. There's some common sense. In fact, I have a rig very similar to this. I have Warrior Assault Systems rig. I absolutely love it. Same color, almost the same style. Um, I do actually kind of like his front big pouch there as an OP or an observation post member. A lot of our documents, maps, you know, range cards, all that stuff can go inside of there. My, my vest has a little pouch for that, but not quite enough. You can see he's got four pouches there with looks like at least two to three mags each. For an operational deployment, you're going to want at least that. Uh, the Canadian Armed Forces TAC vest currently right now will hold four on your front and one or two in some spare pouches. Six in total, you know, yes, I would say that's definitely front line. I, you know, you can have enough ammunition to support you in an operational deployment. But in this situation, he's packed up, you know, close to eight magazines. Definitely worthwhile um, in a situation that he's in. You'll also notice on his left leg there, which he's going to go over, I think, in a second, is a different holster, which is maybe why he hasn't put his his pistol on his holster like that uh, on his on his thigh. They're actually holding the 40 millimeter grenades, high explosive grenades for his M203 that he's going to show. You'll notice his gloves on the front of the TAC vest there. Um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, glove brands you can get, mechanics and, you know, etc, etc. Gloves are so important, guys. Going on operational deployment, especially in the heat, um, you know, gloves are your best friend. I went to Afghanistan about three different pairs of gloves. Um, and only one of them really lasted. Um, very, very important you get good gloves when you're going out on deployments or even on training exercises because they are your lifesaver. Having a pinched thumb or, or, you know, the web between your hands, things like that, that can ruin four or five weeks of exercise. It can really ruin an operational deployment, especially handling weapon systems all day. Your gloves are there for a reason. It's not just there to, to annoy you. In the heat, you know, when I was in the Rimi picking up tools in the heat and you're on deployment, it's, it's red hot. I mean, you can barely touch the tools, uh, let alone your rifle, right? Everything that metal absorbs heat. So you're going to want to have those gloves on uh, and also protection from the environment too, right? There's some nasty critters out there. You know, in Afghanistan, we've got camel spiders and bugs and all sorts of stuff. Um, you never know where your hands are going to go in the next brush, wood line, whatever it may be. Gloves are there to help you. So I cannot emphasize enough how important gloves are. You'll also notice he's got a watch on there, G-Shock watch. I've done a video on this in the past about equipment that you should bring. The G-Shock, yes, great watch, love it. I've had issues with them before. They're banding snaps. I have a Garmin. Um, I love Garmins. They're well robust. They're a great GPS watch. Of course, in an operational deployment, your GPS watch should not be turned on anyway, uh, technically. But uh, for the rest of his rig, you know, he's got a medical pouch there. He looks like a little side admin pouch, a few pouches around the side at the back there as well. And he's got a camel back on the back. Really important um, I can't again emphasize enough how good camelbacks are. Having a spare water bottle is also really important. The reason for that is if you have to douse a casualty down, you know, it's going to heat stroke or whatever, you're going to want something that's ready accessible that you can pull out and just douse on the guy. Or I know this sounds ridiculous, it's a good firefighting tool as well. I've had situations where electronics inside of armored fighting vehicles have failed. Um, you don't have anything around you to put it out, you're in a confined space, water bottle, splash it on there. When you're with a camelback, you're not going to be like. Pfft, it just it just doesn't work, right? So camelbacks are your primary. Water bottle is your secondary. Some people would debate that and say your water bottle is your primary and your camelback is your secondary. But in an operational deployment like this, my camelback was my primary, mainly because I was a driver or commander in an armored fighting vehicle. You don't have the ability to pick up water bottles in a cup of and try and drink. 
you've got the straw right there you can just drink from it. Get a good, robust Camelback. Don't get the cheap knockoff ones off eBay. They'll fail within 10 minutes. Camelback are a tried and trusted brand. Use them. They're fantastic. Um, other than that, you know, he's got his, his radio connection here. I think he also has an IR strobe on his right shoulder. Really important, especially if he's working with helicopters, which he is with the Chinooks. He's going to have that IR strobe on there pretty heavily, especially in obviously night operations to ensure that he's tracked. And when there's dust storms, I'm telling you, you know, even with tanks, uh, it's important to have those, those IR strobes because there's so much dust. All this, you know, powder-like sand. It's not like the sand you see in, like, say, the Sahara, where it's like granulated, thick sand, like sugar. This stuff is like baby powder, and it just turns everything around you into like a smoke screen uh, when helicopters or vehicles are traveling at high speed. So IR strobes are really important. On the back here holds three liters of water. So three liters is a good amount of water. That's a heavy duty Camelback. Again, you can tell it's a Camelback brand. These fail all the time, by the way. So if you're going to take a Camelback, bring a couple of extra of the nozzles because they do get caught on stuff. They break. There's nothing worse than having three liter Camelback burst on you and having no way to correct it by putting a spare one in there so i always bring a couple of spare nozzles because you know you're going to spend 100 bucks on the camelback they're a 10 dollar part uh, and if you're at an operational deployment like this you're not going to get one on on amazon overnight right so bring a few extra with you i've seen so many people investing in camelback it gets caught on a bit of rigging or even when they're just putting their rucksack on their small pack it snaps that nozzle off there's water pouring all over their kit i'm like oh well i'm screwed they either have to pinch it off with a zip tie and then cut the zip tie off every time they want to have a drink, which is ridiculous, or just bring more Camelback nozzles. Um, yeah, you'll notice his uh, pressel there is for his radio. He's got his side radio pouch there. Uh, some radios are a little bit more cumbersome than this. The uh, the uh, 152 is a fairly large radio, even though it's you know, for its size and what it can do, it's not that big. But uh, some pouches are a little bit more awkward than others so you're going to want a nice thick pouch that can hold this tight to your body and it's not flapping all over the place but it looks like he's got his under control yep oh and of course a nice carabiner there right carabiners are really important they can throw all sorts of kit on there i have one for my helmet one for my gloves uh, so if i want to take my helmet off and have to carry around with me i can just loop the links of the uh, the chin strap onto that clip there and off i go and the same for gloves because if you lose your gloves you're gonna be pissed and putting them into your into your pockets it's not the best way because if you're crawling through the brush or doing something else and they accidentally fall out, it's not a good time. Plus, gloves get really sweaty. So you don't want to put in sweaty gloves into your pockets all the time, just, you know, soiling up your pants. Uh, let them air out in front of your kit. Get really thirsty over here. Clip that up. So you'll notice in this rig, right, he's got one singular strap, heavy-duty strap there. That's what you want. If you're going to buy a, a, a rig, make sure it's strong, right? Make sure it has a heavy-duty thick strap, not these... I've seen some of these horrible like airsoft ones. They've got tiny little straps. Even these buckles are a little risky, right? They're, they're thi thin plastic buckles. My Warrior Assault System does have a few of these. They're not ideal. You can get metal ones that are a little bit better. Um, but ideally, you know, look for the ones with the thicker buckles. And you can see his Camelback pouch is actually a separate pouch to his main rig um, that he's attached there. But again, it's got a good clip on the back, not just Velcro. Because again, this stuff can fall out. You know, it's so easy to fall out when you're doing all sorts of bits and pieces. Uh, it's nice and secured, so. As well on my kit, I have a medical pouch that every soldier has when he goes out on, out of the base, I should say. I have my gloves that not only prevent me from getting sunburn, but keep my hands protected. As well as an accessory pouch that I could carry or anything. So those gloves have clearly been purely in a uh, aviation environment. Uh, if you're working with tanks, tracks, armor, uh, or even maybe infantry, these gloves get torn apart real fast. So that's what I'm saying. Bring more than a few sets of gloves. You can already see the sort of the suede on the inside of his gloves is starting to get a little bit worse for wear. But you know, if your gloves ain't got some tears in them, they need some more need some more work on them. No, I'm just kidding. But seriously though, I can't emphasize how important gloves are. There's that IR strobe right on the top there. Uh, on his top shoulder. There's no point putting it in between his pouches here. It needs to be nice and high so it can be seen from above. Uh, or when he's laying down on the floor, it's not in the soil, it is on his shoulder. Um, some people say, well, why don't you put it on your back, Matt? Because then it can be seen from above it anyway. Because you're going to put a small back on the back of there. So you want it on your shoulder because that's going to be the most least exposed. When you're putting an IR strobe on there too and you're putting pouch, uh, sorry, rucks on, you want to make sure that IR strobe is above the strap. You know, again, I've seen many people break these things or, or lose them because they're just not paying attention to the kit when they're mounting it onto their bodies. Anything from a notepad to pens to string, anything. 
Uh, string. Yeah, I mean, string is one, but... Uh, yeah, there's a lot more important things that I'd be putting in my pouch there than string, but I mean, each of their own. Another thing that I have here is my Kevlar helmet. So before we go to his Kevlar helmet, let's just go back a bit. So you can see his um, his headset here, right? So uh, looks like could be, it's hard to tell the brand, but um, these are such good bits of kit. Um, they're expensive, right? We're talking about $130, $140, but they're such good bits of kit because there's nothing worse than wearing ear defense and you can't hear anyone around you what they're saying. But with these, they, they amplify the sound that they can hear. They take it in, you can still, it's like a microphone, right? Um, and a speaker inside the headset, but it will block out high frequency, high decibel um, volume. So this is a essential bit of kit in an aviation world, of course. You know, I work in the aviation industry. Engines are loud, they're powerful, uh, and that high-pitched whine, especially if you're working even with tanks, you know, heavy-duty diesel engines all day, uh, you should have a crew headset anyway. But sometimes you may be working alongside heavy vehicles. Uh, these headsets, these ear protection are really good. The standard little earbuds, I always keep a spare pair of them because you never know when these things fail because they're battery-powered. But just be aware that, you know, those, those headsets, uh, they're fantastic, absolutely fantastic. My Kevlar helmet keeps my head protected for any falls or dangerous things that could happen out there. So the CG634 helmet, um, there's been a couple of variations of it. I actually think it's a really nice helmet. I have no problems with it. You know, you get a lot of people saying they absolutely despise it. It's a general issue helmet. It's not supposed to be specialized with all the fancy stuff. It's meant to do a simple task of protecting your skull from indirect fragments um, or potentially, uh, you know, bumps, hits, whatever it may be. Um, the adjustable straps do get sometimes quite annoying because uh, they do get, you know, stretched and a little bit loose, but they're, it's a good helmet. I mean, I, I like it. Uh, the night vision mounting on it does get a little cumbersome. Uh, you know, when you're wearing night vision for a long period of time, it, it drags down your head, right? But for the most part, it's, it's a good helmet. Uh, you can see he's obviously got his NVG uh, helmet mount on there. And he's got his cat's eye band on the back there. Especially, in the, again, in the aviation industry or operational deployment, you're going to want cat's eyes on the back, knowing that if you're on a foot patrol, the guy in front of you, you know, if your night vision fails, at least you know where the guy in front of you is. You'll be amazed at how scary it is when it's pitch black on a, on a you know, deployment. And all it takes is for someone to turn their head like that. And if your night vision is not adjusted yet, if it's a truly pitch black night, they're gone. Right, so cat's eyes really do, they help a lot. And also they help for uh, if you're completely sleep pooched and you're just totally not where away you are, you wake up from sentry, well, not wake up from sentry, wake up prior to sentry and you're like, hey, where's all my kit? It should be right beside you, but sometimes it takes you a little bit of time. You can tell exactly where your helmet is. It should be the, one of the first things you put on. Uh, cat's eyes are really useful, so. Next up, I have my ballistic goggles that allow me to protect my eyes from the rotor wash when the helicopter comes down and we get out, because without these, I won't be able to see a thing. Okay, so this is such a good point. Um, I cannot emphasize enough how good those things are. We do not use them, I find, in training in in Canada, just on home home turf enough. A lot of the armored guys do, um, you know, armored recce, um, obviously the aviation side. But, you know, when it comes to dismounted role, they're not used very often, but when you're on deployment, they are your best friends. Again, if you have two sets of them, uh, when I went to Afghanistan, I had like two or three sets, actually. I had the two issued set and one of my own um, because these scratch up super easily. Um, they get super dusty. The, the ports that can prevent the dust getting get clogged. You have to blow them out. Uh, they can be cracked real easily, um, but they're great bits of kit. A lot of people leave them on their helmet, which is fine, but again, your helmet gets thrown around a lot. Um, it gets bumped off things. Ideally, you want to try and keep this in a position where it's, you know, more safe in your small pack and bring it out when you need to. Uh, you can leave it on your helmet, though, but as you can see, he hasn't. Uh, some people just leave it around their necks, too, but it's such a good bit of kit, especially working around helicopters. Um, you know, coming off the back of a Chinook, and again, in this talcum powder-like sand, this thing, you need it. You, you literally cannot see if you don't wear those things. Standard eye protection is not going to help you. Won't be able to see a thing. Last but not least is my C8 service rifle. So... As you can see here, it's a typical Canadian Forces rifle. I have my PEC-2 laser, uh, laser. It's an infrared laser that I could only see with my NVG. Okay, so the C8. Uh, the C8 is the carbine version on the smaller barreled version of the C7 standard service rifle. Um, C8, it, 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 
pretty basic, right? It's a, it's a standard C7 Colt C7. Uh, Canadian Forces standard issue 5.56, 30 round magazine. You can notice in this situation, he's put a 203 on the bottom there. Um, it's I must admit, it's not often I've seen a lot of C8s with a 203 on the bottom. Um, I, I'm not fully, I'm not, you know, fully infantried, but uh, you normally you're seeing the C7s with the, uh, the 203 on there. His PEC-2 laser, obviously very important again, you know, in the aviation world, uh, flying around. Uh, if he does need to allocate the targets or indicate someone on the ground or in the air of something that he's seeing, PEC-2 is a powerful laser. It's going to be able to indicate that pretty well. Uh, again, punching through that dust and all that nastiness, the PEC-2 is a pretty powerful bit of kit. Very useful for designating things uh, and for, for visual indication, target indication. And that's a pretty nice rig. It's a pretty nice setup. Um, personally, myself, I would like a C7, but understandably, he's in an aircraft aviation role. He doesn't want a long barrel, 20-inch barrel C7. He wants the shorter carbine version. Make complete sense. Um, personally, in Afghanistan, I barely use my service rifle. I was using either the chain gun or my Browning. Uh, not Browning, sorry. So I'm getting used to the Canadian forces. My SIG, um, my, my SA-80 was basically left in a garbage bag inside of the Warrior most of the time. Uh, but in this situation, I think this is his primary service rifle. So, and he has that 203. Um, of course, 203 is a predominant, uh, you know, uh, high explosive fragmentation round. Pretty useful if you need to put some heads uh, into the soil. But the times are changing. You know, the 203 is starting to be transitioned a little bit. There's different uh, options out there than the standard 203. But still, really nice rig that he's got there. And you can see the standard C7A2 optic there. Uh, I've had no problems with the Elkin personally. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, I don't like it, I don't like it. Slings, let's talk about slings for a second. Slings are my pet peeve. I hate slings that are annoying on my body. I have to have, I'm very specific to my slings. That's because I think the British Army sling for the SA80 is one of the best slings that they've, they've had. Uh, it's a really nice system. You can turn it into a rucksack, like a backpack for your rifle and that sort of stuff. Um, this sling looks a little bit different. It's not kind of something I would choose. Um, I like to have the quick connect and the open strap so I can quickly pull it into um, the high ready if I wanted to, but uh, each to their own again. As well as the M203 grenade launcher that I previously showed you. So this goes in here, makes a big boom. So this is the kit that I wear on my calls. Usually every time I go out, I'm wearing about maybe 50 pounds of gear, including uh, my rifle and my vest not including my day pack uh it's 50 degrees outside 50 pounds calls for a hot day so you know 50 pounds a lot of people think that's not much um i guarantee he's actually going to have more than that um because eight magazines alone with full rounds inside of there plus those 203s plus his mvgs um and uh the extra water he, you're racking up some weight real fast there your frag vest your plates um it, it's, it gets heavy right um, you obviously wouldn't be wearing your MVG primarily in the day, depending on if he's operating in a scenario where he's going from day to night, then yes, he may leave it on because you don't want to be fiddling around looking for MVGs in your kit uh, and you want it pre-mounted. Personally, I never wore my MVG unless absolutely necessary. Um, when you're driving in convoy, luckily you have the convoy lights to see where you're going. Uh, and my MVGs inside the vehicle was the BGTI or Battle Group Thermal Imaging System. wasn't very great, but it was uh, it was better than looking through the uh, the small mono monocle that you have for uh, for uh, night vision. You can see again he's put his uh, his his uh, goggles on the top there. Definitely a good personal preference. But this is a good setup. I would be very comfortable, very very comfortable going into uh, the role he's in or multiple roles actually on deployment in what he has right now. I'd be very comfortable. I like his rig. I obviously like his rifle setup with the 203. He's got a good setup for his water and hydration. Uh, he's got the IR in the right location. Uh, he's got the good headset. Um, you know, Browning, not quite where I'd want it to be, probably in my right thigh. And uh, the spare 203s on his left leg. So, you know, a good rig, good setup. And I know a lot of people tear into, you know, uh, Canadian Armed Forces kit. And I don't think it's right. You know, I understand that there's a lot better kit out there, but for what? what i've used it for it seems to work pretty good i've talked to many veterans of afghanistan from the canadian forces and they enjoyed the kit that they were issued uh, it wasn't perfect but it did the job and again they customized but uh, it's nice to see you know these as i said nice to see these little blurbs of what kit we do use um although some of it unissued it's the majority of it is and it does what it needs to do you know it's it's not the uh the, the piece de resistance of the best of the best 
but it will get the job done. And some of those points I mentioned in this video today, hopefully you can take a little bit away from it, things like gloves and water and hydration, especially if you're going to hot environments. Of course, this all changes when you go into a colder environment, obviously, but uh, that's a different story for another day. So I hope you learn a little bit about, uh, you know, this uh, <laughs> React 2. Um, and if you enjoyed it, let me know. Leave, uh, leave a comment in the comment section. I'd love to hear your, your opinion. And uh, if you want to see more of these kind of videos, let me know. Uh, click the little bell by the subscribe button. Hit that like button. It really does help me. It really helps me. Please, please, I beg you. No, I'm just kidding. But if you do enjoy the video, it does help if you click the little like button and leave me a comment. Um, and if you want to go check out uh, my social media below in the description box, you can check out my Instagram, my Facebook. I also have my Patreon and my PayPal there. So you can uh, you know, support my channel if you wish to. I would really appreciate it. But of course, please don't donate if uh, you know, you've got your own financial situations going on. And for those who have supported and donated, thank you so much. It really does mean a lot um, for the bottom of my heart. Also, you can go check out my um, sponsorship page in terms of clothing. I'm being sponsored right now by a clothing brand called Attire for Effect. It's artillery-based clothing brand. Really, really cool. You should go check them out for sure. Uh, and the website's in the description box. So that's it for today, folks. Have a wonderful day. All the best and bye-bye.